Hey, it's Michael. And before we get started with today's episode, I have a question for you. If you were to begin asking questions of and communicating with those with whom you disagree, what would you stand to lose? Welcome to the follow-up question. I'm your host, Michael Ashford. Come with me on a journey as I explore how we communicate well. What we have been taught about communication and what has been modeled and incentivized through culture has left us in a place where we know how to exert our ideas and opinions and beliefs onto each other, but we miss the entire other half of conversation, the extraction. My aim with this show is to bring you perspectives and ways of looking at issues or topics that perhaps you haven't considered before, to teach you how to ask curious questions, how to seek understanding over certainty, how to listen and give space, so that ultimately you might become a better communicator. I'm a former journalist who believes everyone has a story to tell, and it's only when we ask questions and listen that we reveal what connects us as humans. Our dreams, our desires, our experiences, our ideas, and what we stand for rather than what we are against. One of my favorite discoveries over the course of this little communications exploration I've been on is this concept that In order to communicate across divides and begin to better understand each other, we must learn to adopt the language of those we disagree with and speak in their terms. Many of my guests here on the show have touched on this point. Guests like Nisha Anand in episode 46 and Peter Coleman in episode 47 and James Parker in episode 68, to name a few. This week's guest exemplifies this approach more than perhaps anyone else I've come across. Elizabeth Dahl is the director of Braver Politics at Braver Angels. If Braver Angels sounds familiar, other guests like Monica Guzman and Adam Wilkinson are affiliated with the nonprofit's mission to bridge the partisan divide here in the United States. You see, Elizabeth is a conservative in the Democrat stronghold area of Bainbridge Island, Washington. And she has been active in politics in Washington since her teenage years when she began volunteering on political campaigns. But rather than act like prey backed into a corner by a predator, if I may use that analogy, Elizabeth engages. She seeks out answers to uncomfortable questions She communicates rather than shouts, and it works. In this conversation, Elizabeth offers up the strongest case I've heard yet for why using the language of those you disagree with, despite how discomforting it might feel, it's the best way to open dialogue, to uncover common ground, and ultimately create ways to solve issues together. Toward the end of our conversation, Elizabeth also makes the case that this approach must start locally and expand outward. Rather than the top-down approach we so often get consumed by in politics these days. I heard you say recently, and I quote, ask questions of your own ideas, ask questions of others' ideas, ask questions of every idea. Now, as a podcast host whose podcast is named The Follow-Up Question, you know that I love that quote uh, in in all its forms. But I'm curious from, from you, Elizabeth, and I took that from a recent episode of the Braver Angels podcast. When did that become your mentality? How long have you had that mentality of asking questions, not only of others' ideas, but also, as you first said, of your own ideas? Where did that come from for you? My mom was an elementary school teacher for 10 years, and I was a precocious early reader child. And so honestly, from my 
earliest childhood, she was constantly instilling a sense of curiosity into me. And I don't remember a time, consequently, where I didn't ask questions. I was that child that my parents once stopped uh, on a very long road trip at a super Walmart along the way so that we could buy a dictionary so that I could look up a word that I'd found in a book that I didn't know. Um, I was introduced to the Dewey Decimal System early and I would go to the library and check out every single book that the library had on the topic that I was interested in and read every single one of those books in a two week period. Uh, I, I have always had an extreme level of curiosity. So that that's wonderful. And I, I absolutely love that, Elizabeth. How, let me see if I can ask this question the way that it's floating around in my mind. How did, how did the world not knock that out of you? How have you kept that curiosity up? with everything that we have, we face as adults, especially these days, how do you keep it going? It's a great question. And one that I hadn't thought too much about, actually. Uh, I think primarily it's just that I have always been driven by a desire to improve my community, improve myself, improve processes. From my youngest childhood, I've was always driven to learn, you know, how does this work? Why does it work this way? Is there a way that it can work better? What controls it working this way? And is there any way that I can change that? And I'm still driven by those same things today. And so I look around me and I ask questions and I interrogate the world because that's how you innovate. That's how you improve things. That's how you change the world for the better. Now I've seen you, you've worked on Gosh, so many political campaigns there in the state of Washington. Uh, you've, you've been involved for a very long time now. When did when did you get the itch to begin diving into politics and working on campaigns? Where did that come about? I was born a nerd also. I really can't explain where it came from because my parents were not super political. Uh, I did grow up listening to talk radio sometimes with my dad, but just one particular show host, Michael Medved, that he really liked. And that was really it. I've just always wanted to know what makes things work and why they work the way that they do. And how does the government around me work? Why is there a park in the city? And how did that come to be? And why does it look the way that it does? And just really interesting things that children don't usually wonder about. I was that child asking all of the questions. And when I learned about politics uh, in high school, as a 17-year-old, I had the opportunity to intern on a congressional campaign. And I had previously thought that I'd wanted to work for the FBI. I thought that I could improve my community that way. I could be a problem solver. I could help people. And then I discovered that I could do all of those things at 17 and be paid for it in campaign work. And it gave me the opportunity to improve my environment. It gave me the opportunity to understand what was happening behind the scenes and a lot of news headlines and to learn Uh, first, why things happened the way that they did in my community. And then secondly, the opportunity to improve that and change that and have an impact. And to 17-year-old me, that was absolutely mind-blowing. And I really liked it, as it turned out. I was really good at it, and I could get paid for it. So I never really looked back. And it's become a passion, uh, (laughs) an addiction I can't tear myself away from, and I wouldn't rather be doing anything else. That's interesting that you say that in the light of the fact that, uh, and and certainly I, I talk about this in the intro to this episode, but you are a conservative Republican in a very... Uh, blue, left, liberal, however, whatever uh, side you or term you want to attach to it, state in there in Washington, you come from a very left leaning community. Um, it's interesting that you said that you you can't imagine doing anything else in light of the fact that 
I assume it feels like you're fighting an uphill battle at times, but just what has that experience been like for you, Elizabeth, in, in terms of being a red and a blue state? I guess I'll frame it like that. I hate using that binary, but what has it been like for you? It really led me directly into Braver Angels. Uh, working in politics in a state that was largely opposed to me and in a region that's largely opposed to me meant that I had to learn how to communicate across divides. As a younger teenager, I was just like most teenagers are. I was pretty polarized in my thinking. I was a very black and white person. And I thought that if I shouted my ideology loudly enough and my desires loudly enough, that that would in fact get the return that I wanted. And living in blue districts, working in blue districts and working in purple districts taught me that that was actually the opposite of the case. (laughs) And that if I wanted to persuade people of something, if I wanted to pass good policy, if I wanted to see good policy written, that meant that I had to understand people who didn't think like me. That meant that I had to understand the flaws that they saw in my proposals and then innovate responses to that. I learned that the only way that I could communicate with a group of people who lived in a bubble that was different than mine was to enter their bubble and learn to speak like they did and to understand their concerns and understand why they made the choices they made and what caused them to vote the way that they did and why we might be different and where we might have common ground and then appeal to that common ground to make inroads and build relationships and eventually work together on policy. Elizabeth, that, that switch that you flipped, um, that, that recognition that simply screaming your position louder than the other side to drown them out. Is there a moment or a story or a person where that, that became true for you, that you truly understood the effect that, that going about it a different way can have? There was no one particular moment. It was instead a series of moments over the course of that first congressional campaign that I worked on. I was knocking on doors in the very blue urban core of Tacoma and talking to people who had very different life stories than I did and understanding them and hearing their concerns and learning from them and learning things that completely opened my mind to different ways of thinking that opened my mind to different pathways for policy and was really uh, really gave me the opportunity to challenge my own thinking and also to build relationships with new people. I'm an extrovert, so I find building relationships with strangers over talking politics to be great. <laughs> and so over the course of that campaign, it was just the discovery like, oh, when I say things the way that I grew up saying them, nobody understands me, first of all. And secondly, when they start to understand me, they're afraid of me. And if they're not afraid of me, they hate me. And I'm not having any impact this way. I can't change anything if nobody will listen to me. Well, how do I get them to listen to me? Oh, well, I have to understand them and I have to speak their language and I have to appeal to the common ground that we share. And that means that I have to find the common ground that we share. And that means that I have to have a relationship with them. And so it was really it was a really intuitive path when you are knocking on several hundred doors a day. <laughs> it's uh, it's much messier and murkier and, and dirtier than, uh, you know, we, we sometimes make it out to be, isn't it? Um, what's been the hardest thing? What, what's the hardest thing for you to, to realize or, or come to terms with in what you just said, Elizabeth, that, that you've got to, you can't talk how you were, how you grew up talking. You can't say the same things. You've got to speak in a different language, quote unquote. What's been the hardest thing? Probably the hardest thing is persuading other people that they should do the same. Because a lot of people, both on my side and on the side that disagree with me, when Mm. I tell them, you know, you should 
to best build a relationship and to best understand someone that disagrees with you, you should endeavor to use language that you have in common, and you should endeavor to use a vocabulary that they will understand and define your terms. Um, they feel as though they, it's almost as though they have a right to speak the way that they have been speaking, to say the way, say things the way that they want to say them. And if someone else wants to understand them, then it's their job to make the outreach, not theirs. And that, and there's, there's real antipathy to the idea that they have to change the way that they communicate in order to reach someone who's different from them. Elizabeth, as someone who's gone through this, um, why is that so difficult? What what is it about just using different language <laughs> that feels so drastically not even just uncomfortable but threatening? I don't know exactly because it's not been something that I have personally experienced. I'm always driven by what is the best way to accomplish the outcome that I'm trying to achieve. Mm -hmm. And if that means that I'm speaking slightly differently than I was before, if that means I'm using different words to explain the same ideas, then that's where I'm going to go. And I don't have any fear or trepidation associated with that. I suspect from my conversations that I've had with others that a part of it is it's twofold, I think. One is a fear of losing your own identity. And a part of it is feeling insulted that other people aren't willing to understand you. And then also kind of an elite versus not stands like, oh, well, you know, sometimes from blues, you get both if they're not smart enough to understand what I have to say to them, then I'm not really interested in talking to them. And from the red side, you get, well, if they think they that they need to condescend to me, um, or if I need to say things in a different way for them to understand, then I just don't know what they're thinking. Or, you know, I, I just don't want to talk to them. And that, I understand that. I grew up lower middle class and now I live in a city that is decidedly not. And I work around people who are decidedly not. And I am also not anymore. Um, and when I first started entering the world of politics and the realm of that echelon of society, I felt deeply uncomfortable and there was a little bit of resentment there. Like, how dare you not accept me for who I am? How dare you think that I am less than you because I don't have the same vocabulary or the same educational experience that you have? I didn't have the same opportunities as you, and therefore I'm not as smart. I'm not as intelligent. Um, but thinking the best of people changed that for me. And that is always what I encourage in politics. It's really, really tough, uh, but we're predisposed to think the worst of people we disagree with and people that we don't have any experience with instead of thinking the best of them. And if you walk into every engagement, what is the good reason for them to interact in the way that they're interacting? What is the best possible connotation of this? What is the best possible expectation that might be here? And also to ask clarification, uh, ask clarifying questions, ask questions of understanding. If you don't understand something or you suspect an incentive that may or may not be there, you know, ask the question. It, questions shouldn't be uncomfortable. Questions shouldn't make you afraid. And if you're afraid of a question, if you're afraid of the answer to a question, then it's a question you really need to ask. I, I would just like to lift up that answer and like plop it in the in the ears of everyone who's who's struggling with Elizabeth. That was was so so good. Um, let's let's take it maybe a next step deeper then and go beyond the point of just talking about ideas and and speaking the same language, but actually the work, a lot of the work that you have done in terms of 
policy, actually coming up with solutions. When we get to the point where we actually need to come up with solutions and when we actually need to make a decision on something, how does how does the what we've talked about up to this point fuel the the decisions that are made, the actions that come out of it, the policies that are created in such a way where I don't want to say everyone feels like they quote unquote won, but everyone feels like we made progress. Perhaps that's the best way to put it. How does that come together to actually create policy and solutions? When you've found common ground and when you have a relationship, it is much easier to discuss nuanced policy because then you've realized you have a common goal. Your end thing that you want to achieve is very similar. The intent of your policy is shared. The question is, how will we get there? And at the end of the day, people still disagree about how a policy may or may not impact the end goal. And that's often where you see differences come out. And that's why you see people vote so different, so radically differently on different types of policy is usually a disagreement about whether that policy will actually achieve the goal that they share. And if you can at least have that conversation, you know, things can be changed. Things can be tweaked. Verbiage can be tweaked. Things can be added, things can be removed to accommodate the challenges of working with people that are different than you, to accommodate the critiques that people were able to poke in your policy idea, because we're not right all the time. Often, there are, everyone has blind spots. And when you write a policy, you have your own blind spots that you're not going to catch unless you surround yourself with other thinkers that disagree with you. And they're going to poke all the holes in your policy proposal. And sometimes that's a good thing. Sometimes that means your policy is better at the end of the day because you've accommodated the flaws in your thinking that they pointed out. And they conversely do the same. You know, you, you challenge their ideas and they say, oh, you know, that's a good point. As Monica Guzman says, I never thought of it that way. And then you can adjust a policy proposal yeah. to, at the end of the day, be a better policy than it was when you thought of it in the first place. And not only that, but when it comes to the floor for a vote, sometimes that will then get more support, garner more support, because you included a wide array of values and a wide array of people in the process of creating it. Um, and, you know, even if it doesn't garner overwhelming support, maybe at the very least because you heard people out and you tried to ensure that they were understood and that you accommodated them to the best of your ability, you know, where it didn't, in your opinion, interfere with the goal of your policy, um, at least you don't earn so much ire or so much antipathy to your bill, which might give it a better chance of passing, um, give you a better chance of persuading people who might be in the center or who might be moderates on the other side and willing to cross party lines. I want to go a little bit deeper on policy because something else that I heard you say in that, that episode that I, of the Braver Angels podcast that I listened to, where you were talking about um, I forget the title of the episode, but it was basically what what liberals or what left-leaning folks misunderstand about conservatives. And on the topic of policy, I thought you made a very interesting dis, uh, distinction that I want to get into here, Elizabeth. You know, the the left or or liberals, you you characterized it as they are quick to see something that needs to change. They see an injustice, perhaps, and they want to immediately rectify that that injustice or that that need to change and conservative is right there in the title the conservative approach is not and this is where the distinction comes in that you made it's not that they don't want to change it is that they want to more carefully consider and discuss and and talk about the ramifications of change am i character before i ask a question am i characterizing your position on that correctly? Yeah, that, that sounds fair. 
I'm trying to remember if those were actually my words or if those were the words of one of my colleagues on the podcast that I contributed to. Um, these, I, re I remember saying, you know, I have, I think that can, what sometimes happens is that progressives or liberals or Democrats, they have a bias for change and conservatives have a bias for tradition. Um, I would say that what I have is a bias for cautious evaluation of both of those things. Uh, <laughs> I am skeptical of change for the sake of change. I am also skeptical of tradition for the sake of tradition. And so I, I'm not interested in changing something unless you can give me a really good reason, a really good justification, including maybe some evidence uh, to show me that post change will be better than the status quo. And if you can't provide that, I'm probably going to stick with the status quo. I, I often think that even though everyone wants to, quote unquote, do something, sometimes doing something is worse than doing nothing. Doing something bad is not better than leaving things the way that they are. And sometimes we react in a really emotional state and government, government shouldn't react, in my opinion, in an emotional state. Good policy is not written in an emotional state. Good policy is written upon careful and methodical review and evaluation. And you don't get that as a knee-jerk reaction to something that happens. So let's um, let's let's take this exercise uh, further and and talk about if you were, and I think what you just said is wonderful. But if you were having this conversation with a progressive or someone who who was certainly le on the left, how would you characterize that to them? Um, that everything that you just explained there? How would we begin to find some commonality of language there? So generally when I say that, blues understand what I mean because a bias for change or a bias for action is something that is phrasing that's often used. It's maybe it's a Seattle thing. It's used in the tech industry here. Uh, is a bias for action is seen as a very positive thing. It's, I think it's an Amazon value. Uh, and so I say a bias for change or a bias for action. And it's usually, it, it's usually pretty universally understood. Maybe that's unique to the Pacific Northwest and I'm just learning <laughs> that now. <laughs> and so, and so on the, on the flip side, um, you know, the, the bias for action and, and not wanting to, let me, let me back up here a little bit with this question. There is a, there is a heavy, perhaps more so than any time in our history that I, certainly that I feel or that I've lived through, I should say it that way. There is a morality to politics that is layered over a lot of our decisions and a lot of our policies. And you will have people on both sides um, screaming about the morality of policy, and, and we never get to the the intricate or nuanced discussion, I, at least socially and in, in, in the in the atmosphere that we're talking about. Um, how do we get past that discussion of we have to act now because this is morally this there is a moral wrong out here? How how do we how do we justify? I guess putting the the brakes on a little bit there, tapping the brakes to consider the the change that is 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 being proposed. I don't know if that question makes sense or not. <laughs> I I think so. Uh, if I'm understanding you correctly, you're you're asking me how do we is, how do we advocate for tapping the brakes when people are at the height of emotion and really frustrated by something that they see as a moral issue and something, a policy that they want to see change right now, immediately. Uh, but there isn't time granted to actually think about that policy. Correct. Yes. You've said it much more eloquently than I. <laughs> uh, my response to that is just that generally I advocate for acting well, and I 
try to remind people that actions don't always have the intended consequences. And so when we're thinking about how to act, we don't just want to do something. We want to do a particular thing. And time is required to evaluate whether the something that you're proposing will achieve the particular thing that you are trying to advance. And without that evaluation time, without that careful discussion, you might end up doing something that has a lot of unintended consequences, uh, that has results, policy results that you didn't intend. Uh, it might harm people that you didn't even consider because there was no time to evaluate what you were writing. It was just an emotional reaction. It was just a response to something that happened. And so the best way to act is to act well, not simply to act. What do you think, Elizabeth? Is it is it becoming easier, harder to have these conversations? Where do you fall on our ability to come together and have these kind, the kind of nuanced conversations you're talking about? Probably biased from my work in Braver Angels. I think these conversations are getting easier. I have them all the time. And I live on a very blue island. Uh, I walk down to the winery and I have issue conversations with people almost every day of the week. I think that these conversations have become easier since 2016, 2017, where I would say things were probably at a zenith. It was nigh on impossible to have conversation about some topics in the area that I live. Uh, I, something that I've learned working at the national level with Braver Angels is that Seattle is a bubble unlike any other. Uh, when I go to other parts of the country, conversations were infinitely easier than they were in my own backyard. And it wasn't that I was having different conversations. It was just that there were topics here that were kind of verboten, that were more or less off limits in polite society, if you were left of center here, that were definitely not off limits in other parts of the country. And so from my perspective, conversations have gotten much better. And the ability to have nuanced conversations with people on a one-on-one -on -one basis has improved greatly since then. Uh, over the time that I've been in politics, I think conversations are probably slightly better now than they were when I first started. But I would be careful about drawing any sort of a conclusion from that because I was much worse at holding these conversations when I started in politics. <laughs> That's some excellent self-awareness there. I love it. Um, your work in political campaigns and, and actually working, as you said, going door to door, having these tough conversations. I'm curious, as a former journalist myself, what is your vantage point of the way politics is presented through the media these days, through journalism? Um, yeah, as, as somebody who has that background and expertise and experience, where, yeah, what, what, is, what, is, what is your view of it and where perhaps could we improve? Two-part question there. My experience of media has been that it is predominantly very biased uh, and biased to the left generally, although there are plenty of outlets, especially in the last few years, that have popped up that are extremely biased to the right instead. Um, I am at the same time much more bullish than I was several years ago about the fate of journalism, because I have recently seen a lot of independent outlets spring up with the goal of providing neutral news coverage and the goal of offering people an understand an observational understanding of stories rather than one that takes a particular stance on a given issue. 
Um, I'm really hoping that a lot of those take off in a way that I haven't quite seen come to fruition yet. Um, living through 2018 may have been the darkest year, in my opinion, in terms of journalism. Uh, I have read so many news stories that were not just biased, but said something that wasn't true or implied something that wasn't true and then failed to justify that implication within the text of the article. Uh, so many stories, whether it, and then 2018 into 2020, whether about COVID, I can't tell you the number of stories that I picked apart that were, you know, this such and such state is overwhelmed by illness. They have no beds left and they're filling up all of their floors. And like, wait, so what, what, what does this article not say? Well, it doesn't say that they're overwhelmed by COVID cases. That's the implication, but that's not what it says. And then I would go to the state's Department of Health website and look at the hospital capacity because during COVID, pretty much every single state was tracking that. And I would find out that, oh, yeah. Mm -hmm only 33% of their beds are filled with COVID cases. And the rest of that is filled with people doing all of the things that they didn't do because they were locked down for six or eight months. Um, it was incredibly frustrating. And media has lost so much trust, especially on the right. It's incredibly hard for me to convince people on my own side to take media seriously most of the time if it comes from a mainstream source. I have to find some other reason for them to trust it. Um, I have to go above and beyond to provide them details of data. And I have to find different perspectives. I have to find the underlying data source for the article. I have to find the first person quotes. And it's it's incredibly frustrating and it's incredibly frustrating because I don't blame those people that lack trust in the media. I blame the media for having lost that trust, for having written so deceptively for so long, for having written from such a biased perspective that no one believes them. I have to second guess everything and read with a critical lens everything that I come across. Personally, I think everyone should read critically, but most people don't put in the effort and don't have the time, and in some cases, don't have the knowledge base to be able to read truly critically everything that they come across. And sometimes it's not even obvious that they should need to. Uh, actually, just recently, I was talking with a friend of mine who's a columnist for the Spokesman Review in Eastern Washington, and she mentioned a story that she had read about a local food bank that had uh, told a local newspaper reporter that they were they needed more donations and leading up to the holidays, they were really struggling to have enough food to provide to all of the local families in need. And at the same time, my friend had just received a whole sack of potatoes from them, 13 pounds, I think, that she didn't even know how she was going to use, uh, that she didn't even, wasn't even sure that she could use. And she received those not because she was in need, but because they had some items they were just trying to get rid of. They had way too much of several things, and they were trying to find people that were willing to take it. And so she called her reporter friend and said, hey, um, I just received a bunch of extra food from the food bank, but you wrote a column saying that they need more food. What's what's going on here? What's the real story? And her friend, who was the reporter who wrote the article about the food bank, didn't even know because she would just received a press release from the food bank and essentially written the story that the food bank asked her to write. And... I wouldn't have even thought to question an article like that because, of course, it's a food bank leading up to the holidays. Why wouldn't they need food? Uh, and you have to read critically about everything. And the fact that people have to think about that and often don't 
is the reason that media has lost trust because that sort of writing, that sort of bias, that sort of misleading information is in almost every article from mainstream media and it always cuts against the right. It almost never cuts in the other direction. And thus there's there's deep media distrust and it's completely justified. And as for how they can do better, uh, step outside their bubbles. Um, it's been, it's been somewhat, uh, and it's been really enlightening to me actually talking with Monica much more frequently about journalism and about her experience with journalists and reporters, because she'll tell me, no, they, they just don't, they don't understand that there's red and blue vocabulary. They're not intending to write from such a heavy bias. They just are. And that's that's been mind-blowing to me a little bit because as someone that has worked in politics here for so long, uh, I can't help but see left-leaning bias in nearly everything. It's in the style guide for the AP in immigration, in the way that they write about abortion, in the way that they talk about transgender issues, um, it's it's written into what is required of journalists. You can't even neutrally write about a topic and follow the AP style guide, and that's an enormous problem. That so contributes to the lack of trust that you don't even know the difference between red vocabulary and blue vocabulary and don't recognize when you're writing from one or the other as in an article that's not supposed to be an opinion piece and an article that's supposed to be a piece of neutral, hard-hitting journalism is terrible, is undermining the trust in media and will continue to undermine the trust in media until journalists start stepping out of their bubbles and seeking to understand people that are different from them and writing about the things that they believe in a way that is thoughtful and honest instead of from their blue perspective about these rubes that they encountered who believe this crazy thing. Yeah, absolutely, Elizabeth. I mean, you've you've hit on something that I have been very critical of my former my former profession uh, in journalism is that um, opinion has seeped its way into what is supposed to be neutral news reporting uh, far more to to where it becomes entertainment much more so than it does actual reporting of the news, even even down to headline writing, to, to your point, capitalizing on the fact that they, they know people probably aren't going to read the article to get the full detail, whether you believe the article is biased or not is another discussion, art, discussion point. But the headline so often does not match. Uh, the, the headline that you see on social media or that you see promoted across you know, Slack channels, or for, for instance, does not match the content of the story. Um, it is. It is a problem in journalism, and and certainly you're you're right as well. There's a even in the small town newspaper that I worked at, there was certainly a left leaning bias um, that was was not. Uh, they weren't shy about it. I'll say. Um, so, my my the question that comes to my mind for you, Elizabeth, in hearing all that is, um, is it hard for you to get? <laughs> I don't know how to word this any other way. To get conservatives, uh, other conservatives to come along with the ideas that you're talking about, knowing everything that you just talked about, is it hard for you to, I don't want to use the word convince, but yeah, to get others to come along with this idea. I know we kind of touched on this at the beginning of the conversation, but it just seems like the work, the uplift is so great there. It can be. Um, mostly because there's just so much distrust there you know and it's not sometimes I'll encounter an idea from the left that is like goes something along the lines of well we're just really we were so angry about Trump that we you know we treated all Republicans the same but you know we don't we don't really want to do that and why don't they trust us you know we're trying to we're past that and we're trying to move on and it goes so much deeper than Trump. Media bias as a problem for the right and as cutting against the right has been ongoing 
for decades. I think of Trump as the coroner rather as Ben Shapiro says as the coroner rather than the cause. Uh, the, the distrust that led to that was building for years and years and years. And so it takes more than a few months or even a couple of years to restore that trust. You, know, you can't just flip a switch. Just, just like in a relationship, you know, when someone hurts you and someone does something to cross a boundary, you can't just flip a switch and decide that it's okay and everything is fine and dandy and you'll trust them again. You have to show them, you have to earn that trust. And you have to show them that you really, really mean it, that you are interested in changing and that you're trying to improve. And that's something that is going to take time. And I struggle sometimes to bring conservatives into rooms, not so much actually with people that live around them, but with maybe more to virtual events where they're just going to be engaging strangers and they're kind of concerned about whether they're going to be respected and concerned about whether Braver Angels rules will actually be followed. Um, but generally, Braver Angels provides a great framework for these conversations. And I find that my conservative friends are really open to having conversations with people that disagree as long as the rules are followed and as long as they can um, embrace trusting the people that they'll be in conversation with. And so it keeps it, it always comes back to the relationship building and the trust for me. And I think for conservatives writ large. I think that's a wonderful, wonderful place to leave it, Elizabeth. Um, final question for you. What is a question that you wish you were asked more? How can I get involved on the local level? People are often really excited about the work that we do on a federal level. They're really excited about the workshops that we're running with congressional committees and congressional members and congressional staffers. They are a whole lot less excited about the workshop that we just ran with the Washington State Association of Counties or in New Hampshire with all of their local election officials or with state legislatures across the country. And yet that is ultimately where change happens. I think that it's a widespread misconception that if you change Congress, you can change the country and change the political culture. The reality is that much of this country changes from the ground up, and that includes our political culture. You don't change Congress by changing Congress. You change Congress by changing the country. And you change the country by engaging on the state and local levels. Ooh, that's so good, Elizabeth. Why, why is that so hard for us to connect with? Um, the, the, the idea that that which we're closest to is where we can have the most impact. I think a lot of people just don't know and don't understand that. It's something that I preach on a daily basis and something that I tell everyone of every age that I speak to about politics. I spoke with a high school class a couple of weeks ago, and I tried to instill it in them. And every time that I speak with a group of people that tells me, we're just so frustrated by how angry everyone is in politics, and so we're not involved, I again try to impress on them that state and local engagement is where it's at. So many people don't realize that it's their local city council or their county commissioners that control what they can do with their property and how they can do it. They don't realize that the permits to remodel their home have to go through the county, not Congress. Uh, the, the, the often the things that have the most impact on their day-to-day -day life, <laughs> the energy code that determines how expensive, how much it will cost to build homes in their neighborhood, the permitting requirements and the design review board that is required for new projects to be approved, new developments in their communities. All of that happens at the state and local level. Um, you know, the impact on crime and the impact on the economy all of, well, not all of that, but a good chunk of that also happens at the state and local level. When you're talking about even gas taxes, you know, a chunk of those are federal, but 
especially on my end of the country, it, more half or more than half of those are state taxes. All of the state and local government has an impact mm-hmm. on the way that you experience your daily life. You know, the, the cost of transportation of food within your state is often a result of different taxes and different policies that exist around the trucking industry or labor within your state. And there's so many parts that people just don't, people just don't know. And they will never know unless someone is able to tell them about it, unless they come into contact with someone that knows. And so I'm constantly encouraging people, you know, get involved at the state and local level, show up to your city council meeting, show up to your county commissioner meeting once in a while, keep an eye on what they're doing, talk to them, build those relationships. It's so much easier to change out your city council person than your congressman. It's much easier to convince your county commissioners that they should embrace depolarization and that they should really understand all of their constituents than it is to convince your congressman of that. And when you build those relationships on a local level, you can have an impact regardless of who you are. I was a 17-year-old no-name person from a relatively poor family with no political experience to speak of and no background in anything and no connections. And yet somehow I changed the course of my state by working on a state Senate campaign where my candidate won, and that changed the balance of the state Senate. If I can do that at 17, anyone can have an impact in their state and local government. It just takes showing up. That's beautiful, Elizabeth. And I I appreciate you. I appreciate the work you do, uh, the work that Brave Angels does. Thank you so much for for joining my show today. I appreciate it. And uh, best wishes to you, okay? Thank you. All the thanks to Elizabeth Dahl for sharing her story on the show in this episode. Please do me and Elizabeth a huge favor. Share this episode with someone you know who might find some value in listening to our conversation today. Share the episode with your network and help us spread the good word about the importance of asking the deeply uncomfortable questions that we may not like the answer to. And if you like the conversations with the amazing guests like Elizabeth that I have on each and every episode, Subscribe so that you never miss when a new episode drops. If you would like to get in touch with me, you can always email me at michael at the follow-up question.com or you can go to michaelashford.com and reach out there. I'll catch you on the next episode of The Follow-Up Question. And until then, keep asking questions.